Well, Eric, getting things kicked off here this week, of course, wanting to start off with a lot of those severe storms that we saw kind of on the back half of last week, getting things kicked off here very early this morning. I know we saw some severity going through South Dakota, through Iowa here a little bit. Also wanting to blow things out a little bit on, you know, just the continuation of a pattern that we've seen of just multiple storm systems bringing moisture into many parts of the Corn Belt. Good for some, maybe not so good for others. Just talk about that and how we're kind of shaping up here for the near term. Yeah. So, you know, this first radar animation starts off last night on Sunday night and goes through uh, midday today. And you can just see the massive storms that started in South Dakota, Minnesota. They went through Iowa, clipped parts of Wisconsin, northern Missouri, came through Illinois. And I mean, this is the same spot that's been getting over and over and over hit. And we're filling in some of these little holes that were there. My backyard was one of those holes and it got filled in on Sunday um, I had an inch and three quarters, four miles down the road. They had seven inches from one of these storms. Now, this is not one you're seeing here, but one over the weekend. And the rain is just, uh, it's been there. We've had complete open access to the Gulf moisture. And, uh, this, you know, as we know this time of year, our, our corn and soybeans are also evaporating a lot of water into the atmosphere. But I got to tell you something. When these storms started last night in South Dakota, a uh, bunch of storm chasers converged on the initiation point up in South Dakota, right here near Watertown. And uh, I don't know if you've seen this yet, but some of these guys got really, really close to these tornadoes. And just this one, like a drill press going into the ground here, uh, shot by uh, Brandon Kopic. Uh, just incredible to see that. But, you know, we, we have questions as to where it might be today. So this is the same area, but now it's extended. And the Storm Prediction Center, just before you and I started talking, updated this and now have a much larger part of South Dakota, Minnesota, and Iowa under the moderate risk. So there's only one more category above that, and that's high. And my biggest concern about this is being confirmed in the models, yet you and I are talking well ahead of when these storms are going to move through. So what I'm talking about is this. In this animation, we're picking this up this afternoon, this evening. Watch the line of storms move out of South Dakota into Iowa. And we do not want to see structure like this on the on the simulated radar. That is a that's a bow echo. If it's large enough and moves fast enough, we would classify this as a derecho in Iowa. No one wants to ever relive August 10th, 2020. And unfortunately, we're starting to see just the risk of that taking shape. Now, as you get into the overnight hours, the system's going to gust itself out and probably die somewhere by where Iowa, Missouri, and Illinois all come together. I think that's what's going to happen here, but there just is elevated risk tonight. So I hope people get a chance to watch this this afternoon. Have multiple modes of keeping yourself aware of the weather. So weather radio, keep the TV on, listen to the radio, go to weather.gov. Like that is your spot uh, to go with respect to this. But the reality is it's hitting the same areas that have been hit with storms. And if you look across the majority of the Corn Belt, We've been wet. I mean, it's been quite wet. And now for the third week in a row, the NDVI values are at record high. So from space, this crop looks absolutely amazing. Now we've been in some heat as of late, but just to put this heat wave we've been seeing since about July 20th into context, it's not been that hot. I mean, I hate to say it because it's disgusting and nobody's enjoying it, but you'd put it as like a top 30 such stretch of days at the end of July, which means we've had much, much hotter Julys. And by the way, some of my colleagues and friends out in California, I've actually seen them, this is crazy to think about, in the middle of July wearing jackets into their fields in North Central California. That's how cool it's been out West. Now we do know that since the solstice, we've had some warm overnight lows and you and I have talked extensively about this. I just want to give you the latest update. You can see that there's a lot of single digits in the Eastern Corn Belt, meaning this is one of the hottest such stretches. In many places where there's the number one, it is the hottest such stretch of uh, overnight low temperatures. And I'm sure you've heard a lot about this, but we had uh, some of the lower leaves and some of the farms we have in Illinois at our innovation farm have shown some evidence of rapid growth syndrome by all you know, reports from people that study the crop. That's not me. They say this is harmless. It's just symptomatic of what the crop went through. And then we have had just a few isolated plants, just a few isolated plants, not a fields, but just plants that have shown up with tassel wrap. Now that's not to negate any comments that have been said about possible pollination issues. These are, especially over there on the right, the tassel wrap, that's a pollination issue, but it was only a few plants, which means there was cross-pollination from other plants taking shape very efficiently in this field. So <clears throat> while we cannot ignore that heat and the fact that it is historically related to lowering yields, we, we do know that. You know, we, we've also known that the pattern has been kind of 
10 to 12 days on, 10 to 12 days off. So it's not just been like one of those years like 2010 where it didn't stop for four months. It's been different from that. And here we are right now in the middle of a it's on kind of time period, right? There's 31 states with heat watches, heat warnings or uh, uh, heat advisories right now. But Dawson, this is not going to last. I mean, this is today. That's tomorrow, Tuesday. Look, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. I mean, I'm in out to Omaha at the end of the week. I'm in Georgia right now. Where I mean, excuse me, I'm in Florida right now uh, by Jacksonville. And we're in the middle of the heat and humidity, open Gulf, open Atlantic. It's just gross. That is all going to be shoved by this colder, drier air. I'm, I'm heading to Omaha on, on Wednesday. And I mean, I'm going to bring with me some nice, cool air. So I'm going to tell everybody when I get there, you're welcome. I brought this with me, but uh, I didn't. I came from here where it's gross. But uh, this is incredible. Now, listen, what did I tell you? 10 on, 10 off, right? Here we go. That's the next five days. Watch the cool come down day five through 10. Now, after day 10, this is August 7th. Here it goes. Warmth comes back. And during that time frame, we just want to know, do we keep these ridge running storms in this area? Now, if it gets hotter and drier down here, the cotton crop looks pretty darn good in parts of Texas. They're already harvesting. They've probably out finished the corn and some of the soybeans. Some of the other crops grown there are very tolerant to this heat. But you can't argue the fact that we're putting right over the top of this area some pretty good conditions. Now, these folks need rain as they're about to, you know, they, they go through this time period where stuff grows in the fields, usually weeds, that they need to have the ability to knock down and plant um, wheat. If you don't get the weeds to grow up and then you have to dust in your wheat, the weeds and the wheat come up at the same time if it rains in November, right? So they need rain in that area, but just want to make a point that to the you know north of it, it looks like it's going to continue to storm. I mean, a lot. Look at the 15-day forecast from today's European model. I mean, yeah, you find whole south, but there's a lot of places in here, two, three, four inches of rain that are coming through. The dry spots are, you know, here and, of course, in the west or maybe coming out of that part of the Canadian prairie over the Great Lakes. But everywhere that you see white on this graph, that's where I'm expecting storms. So what I'm going to tell you is simply this. When we look out beyond this into later into August, and into even September, unless something big happens in the tropics, my thought process is going to be wash, rinse, repeat. 10 days and then 10 days and then 10 days, you know, like that back and forth and back and forth. And until we break it away and do something different, I can't, I have no evidence to overturn it. So that's where we'll be. Yeah, I mean, just for this long period of time, we've continued to identify that, yes, there are problem areas in some places, but overall, it just seems like moisture is getting to places where it needs to be for a lot of folks. Yeah, I mean, I hate the severe weather side of it, but this map tells you what's going on. Like mm -hmm. uh, this drought in central Oklahoma, they got rain the other day, so the rain came through there. Uh, there has been better moisture in southern Missouri. We filled in these holes in Illinois, Indiana. Iowa, not Iowa, excuse me, Wisconsin and Michigan. There are just very little holes left. Um, and again, I can't argue with this whole idea of the NDVI being so high. So I want to know this, Dawson, if we just transition this into the longer range. I mean, the CPC keeps coming out with these forecasts. I think they're hooked on shifts in the MJO. I'm not. I can't. I'm just not bought into it just yet. Um, but this is what they've got for mid-August. And I would have to argue that maybe this is what we should be talking about for mid-August. What I mean by that is, all right, maybe a little hotter, drier here, but all along the edge, I think we're going to storm everywhere. I just drew all the squiggly lines. I mean, I, what evidence is there to overturn that? And that's the latest update from the European model. So until I see the Bermuda high leave or some big thing sweep through the tropics or a big tropical event take shape, I don't know where, I don't know how to break this pattern. And even though, yeah, some of the longer range forecasts for September and October look drier in this central U.S., I just want you to know that they're basing that off of this developing La Nina. We need to pay attention to the Atlantic because historically, if you correlate this particular pattern we've seen in the Atlantic to our fall precipitation pattern, it actually tends to look more like this, where those purples represent more stormy activity. So I'm not, I'm not overly aggressive on this hurricane season. I'm not overly aggressive on changing the pattern. I think we are just in a like a wash, rinse, repeat cycle with all of this. Yeah. And then just really quick here to wrap things up, too. I mean, when we're talking about the extended forecast, there was a lot of, 
you know, discrepancies? Is a lot of this going to materialize and a lot of that didn't happen, you know, no. a month or two ago? Is there just a little bit more, you know, trying to think of more uh, evidence that this could continue and materialize a little bit better than it has in the past, just based on what we've seen? Well, here's what's crazy. If if we get, uh, where was it here? If we get, uh, there it is, finally. If we get this over the next 15 days, or if it looks like this compared to average, 15 days from now is mid, I mean, that's that's like mid-August. Mm -hmm. We're running out of time for there to be some sort of substantial problem on the crop, right? Other yeah. than the pockets that are dealing with, you know, disease pressure, severe weather damage, emergence problems, that's every year. I think just on the whole, Dawson, this pattern outdid every expectation we had going into this season. All right. Well, going to continue to watch that here moving forward. And like you said, just with those pockets, I don't know. It just seems like a time for, you know, folks, localized areas to just, you know, work with their agronomists on where, you know, things have to be to kind of get this crop to the finish line too. But overall, just going to continue to watch these patterns moving forward and always appreciate your insights, Eric. Yeah, you bet.